Dear precious Father, love sitting in the silence of your house. Love it even more sitting with faithful saints. We've been reminded through the songs today, beginning with the prayer, Be Thou My Vision, drawing our focus on You, then singing about how great You are, how beautiful You are, how great is our God. And then the final song, It is well with my soul that in tragedy we can say that not because things are good, but because we have the love of the Father encircling us and holding us. So Father, we thank you for that knowledge. Lord, I'm reminded that there are too many, much too many, that do not know that peace that do not know the Prince of Peace, that do not know the loving Father that is waiting to receive them. Father, it is an overwhelming task before us that you have chosen us to tell them that they can find love and peace and provision, and strength, and help in times of trouble. Father, help us to rise to the occasion. Empower that Holy Spirit within us to not keep our salvation to ourselves, but to share the good news to everyone. To hear when you're saying speak, to go when you're saying go, to do when you're saying do. It is in Jesus' name that we gather and pray. Amen. Before I go on, I want to share just a, a different piece of news. I'll digress just a minute. As I was leaving yesterday, I heard voices and I uh, came out and uh, it was Benita and she had some guests with her and it ends up it was Bert Montgomery. Some of you remember him. They were up this way. Matter of fact, he's in Louisville. He's doing a chaplaincy at Baptist East. And so I, obviously he got in touch with Benita and they wanted to see the church. And so they came. I got a chance to meet him. I believe if I, my memory's good and it's not, that he told me he was here from 2004 to 2008. And so he, uh, he and his wife, and who else was with him, Benita? Daniel. Okay, they... They walked through, she showed them what God has been doing here. And uh, before he and I parted, I went ahead and left them. He, uh, he said he was praying that God would continue to bless. And I told him how much I appreciated that prayer. I'd seen his name a lot, so I was glad to get to meet him. I, I enjoyed just the moment I had with him. It's going to be interesting where God takes me today. We're in Nehemiah chapter 2. Last week we looked at Nehemiah chapter 1 where he had learned about the state of Jerusalem and became burdened over the city of his ancestry. And he, we looked at the prayer that he did and that is a lesson just in that, that in his burden, in his trial, he didn't turn to his own devices. He didn't look to government. He didn't look immediately to the king. He turned to his God and he poured out his heart to God. And I'll remind you, he started with adoration. We have a, a God more wonderful than we can imagine. He's gooder to us than we realize. And then he proceeded on to confess. We fall short of the glory of God. We miss the mark. And uh, our legacy, uh, uh, fam uh, legacy, I don't know where that came from, family archery that we're doing 
I did the devotion the first night. We're bringing them in halfway through and doing a devotion with them. And I brought up the point that sin is missing the mark. That's what it is. It's missing the mark of the calling of the high, most high God. And that in archery, what we're trying to do is hit that mark every single time. And that's what our goal is in life, to hit the mark that God calls us to. And when we miss that mark, that's sin. And when we sin, we confess. I started the acrostic with you, and I realized after the sermon I didn't finish it. A-C-T is thanksgiving. The next thing we need to be sure to do is give thanks to God. God has blessed us more than we know, more than we realize. We know some of the ways he's blessed us. We don't know how many times he's protected us from a wayward vehicle. We don't know how many times he's, he's uh, protected us from danger. So, but we do know times he's provided, times we've felt his arms around us, as Mr. Spafford did at that moment, giving him some peace in that tragedy. And so we thank God, so we adore him for who he is. We honor him as the creator. We admit that we've fallen short of his glory and ask him to cleanse us, and we thank him for his forgiveness. Then we thank him because a grateful heart is pleasing to God and it sets us in the right place. After all of that, we supplicate. We ask for what it is we've come to him for. Too often, all we do is go before him and say, give me, give me, give me. I need this, Lord. I want this, Lord. We effectively rub the bottle and try to get the genie to come out and respond to what we want him to do, and that's the wrong order of things. So we learned in that prayer of Nehemiah to begin with adoration, recognizing who God is, to confess our sins, to thank him, and then to ask his presence. We're starting in Nehemiah chapter 2 now. You follow with me along on the verses 1 through 8. In the month of Nisan, in the 20th year of King Artaxerxes, when wine was brought from him, I took the wine and gave it to the king. I had not been sad in his presence before, so the king asked me, Why does your face look so sad when you are not ill? This can be nothing but sadness of heart. I was very much afraid, but I said to the king, May the king live forever. Why should my face not look sad when the city where my fathers are buried lies in ruins and its gates have been destroyed, destroyed by fire? The king said to me, What is it you want? Then I prayed to the king of heaven, and I answered the king, If it pleases the king, and if your servant has found favor in his sight, let him send me to the city of Jeru Judah, where my fathers are buried, so that I can rebuild it. Then the king, with the queen sitting beside him, asked me, How long will your journey take, and when will you get back? It pleased the king to send me, so I set a time. I also said to him, If it pleases the king, may I have letters to the governor of Trans-Euphrates, so that they will provide me safe conduct until I arrive in Judah. And may I have a letter to Asaph, king, keeper, of the king's forest, so he will give me timber to make beams for the gates of the citadel by the temple and for the city wall and for the residence I will occupy. And because the gracious hand of my God was upon me, the king granted my request. The title of the sermon today is In Sync with God. And that's where we need to be. That's where we want to be. Several months had passed between chapter 1 and chapter 2. If you look at chapter 1, it says when he started praying, it was the month of Kislev. When you look at chapter 2, it says in the month of Nisan. So some time had passed when Nehemiah has the opportunity to go before the king. And it was dangerous to look downcast before the king. The king didn't want unhappy people around him. He didn't want toxic people. He wanted people to be up and joyous to serve the king. 
And so when Nehemiah comes in, obviously despondent, it was, it was a dangerous moment, and Nehemiah refers to that. But the king cared about Nehemiah, obviously. Nehemiah was his cupbearer. Nehemiah was the one who would taste the wine to make sure it wasn't poisoned, to make sure it wasn't spoiled, so the king wouldn't get sick. So the king cared about Nehemiah, obviously. And he expressed some tenderness here when the king of the empire says, what's troubling you? Why are you downcast? And I think it also testifies to Nehemiah's relationship that he felt comfortable to say to the king, first he honored him, may the king live forever. But then he said, why shouldn't I be downcast? After all, the town where my ancestry is is, is destroyed in, in terrible shape. So the king then does what you want people to do. <laughs> he asks a question. What is it you want, Nehemiah? Gave Nehemiah the door. And then the kind of one focal point of my sermon today, Nehemiah says, then I prayed to the God of heaven. He did a quick short prayer. He didn't have time to get down on his knees to do a long involved prayer. I'm sure it was, help me, Lord. Help the boy. But that was rooted in months of prayer and months of going before the Lord, pouring out his heart. And during that time, Nehemiah is listening to God and God is ministering to his spirit. He is, he is giving Nehemiah ideas and Nehemiah, I believe, is talking to his brother and others to find out what practically the city needed in order to get restored. And I say that because as he goes on, he has a plan to tell the king. He says, king, I want to go back and take care of my city. The king asks again, okay, what is it you need? And Nehemiah gives very specific detailed request to the king. He's thought this through. He knew he was going to need lumber, so he asked for a, a, a royal order to the keeper of the forest to give him the lumber he needed. He knew he was going to need protection, and so he asked for that. He knew he was going to need supplies. So all this time, Nehemiah is pondering about his city and praying to God. He's gathering information, he's planning, he's thinking about what it would take. And when the opportunity comes, he's ready to respond. O oh, king, this is what I need. And the king honored his request and gave him what he needed. And Nehemiah was able to go back. Nehemiah, in that quick prayer, it wasn't the only one he did. It was bathed in prayer, but it was that last minute response to get in sync with God because he needed to speak the right way to the king and he needed to speak very definitely to the king about what he needed. If Nehemiah had not had a plan, if Nehemiah's plan had been confused or a word I like, discombobulated, the king would have been hesitant to provide materials. He would have thought, this guy doesn't know what he's doing. He doesn't have, a, he doesn't, I'm not going to waste my resources, my efforts on helping him. He's not ready to do this. But Nehemiah was ready. He had listened to God. He had talked to God. He had gotten in sync with God. If you don't believe that there is a devil who works, Get into ministry. Because a lot of things are going wrong. And I believe part of that is because we're moving in God's path. Whenever we're not doing anything for God, Satan doesn't have to worry about us. He doesn't have to come against us. We're defeating ourselves. We're ineffective already. But when we start seeking to lift high the name of Jesus Christ, to take the hope 
of Jesus Christ to lost souls who do not know Him or to souls who have gotten discouraged and, and stepped aside from worship. Then He has to get involved. When we start proclaiming the Word of God, He has to stop it. When he, we start lifting up the name of Jesus Christ, I'll share with you real quick. You know we've been trying to get these trailers moved for six months, seven months now. We changed to, we were letting have them. We wondered where they were this weekend. We didn't see them. We got an email that said, my shop burned to the ground this week. Lost everything. And I made the comment, it came to my mind, I made the comment, I think we've found, we've got the curse of the trailers because it seems that trouble comes. And so it makes one wonder. I said it kind of capriciously, but the other person came back and said, I've been wondering that too because we've been trying so hard. We had uh, the baptism scheduled today. I don't know what happened to the young man. I met with him Wednesday, was very pointedly talking to him, making sure he understood about accepting Jesus Christ, that baptism is not what washes away our sin, that it's a testimony of the decision we've made in our life, that it is, uh, it is proclaiming that we have received Jesus Christ as our Savior. And as we talked, I felt convinced that he did understand that. And as he left Wednesday, it was, I'll, I'll be there 1030 Sunday morning ready to go. I hope no ill has befallen him. Uh, but we didn't get to do that. Other things are stepping in the way, but there are some wonderful things happening. We are working. We met yesterday talking about Sunday school. In order to turn our country around, to turn our community around, we need to get people in small group Bible study. I try to be as effective as I can in this sermon to you, but that's a half hour out of your week. And it's receiving information. There's nothing like sitting together in, in a Bible study group, opening God's Word, discussing together what God is teaching, and sharing with each other our week, the good things and the bad things having a support group. When we come in here on Sunday morning, you're all greeting each other, welcoming each other, and I love that sound. But it doesn't compare to when you have a small group that you feel safe with, that you can open up and share a burden, or perhaps share a joy that you don't want to broadcast too widely. There are some of those. So we're, we're wanting to do that in Sunday school. I believe it's the focus that we need to do as a church. It's how I'm leading that we turn our efforts to reach out, and it's going to take reaching out, extending ourselves. When we finished the day yesterday, I asked the group to come in here, and we circled the room. Everybody put a hand on the wall. I asked Darrell Wilson, who led the conference yesterday, to come and stand at the pulpit. John Alton was here, and he went and he, he kind of, it had water in the baptistry, so he, he didn't get in, but he, he was praying over that, what God can do there. And we took time to ask God's blessings upon our church, Certainly the building, we need it to stand so we can be here. But more than that, upon the work of the church to pour out His Holy Spirit, to stir the hearts of His people, to desire to reach people for Christ, to, to enable the efforts that we're putting in. We're seeking to find the way. We're seeking training, not for ourselves, but to help other people find the hope of Jesus Christ. And so we took time to pray. Tom stood back over there by the plaque there with names on it. You know the names. I unfortunately haven't had a chance to meet them. 
And he told me afterwards as he looked at those names and he, he referred to it in his prayer, the work, the faithful work of those saints over the many years. And he told me of the circle. Tell me the name of that circle, Laverne or Tom. Mary? Maud Bryant Circle. Some of y'all are nodding your heads. You remember how that was a small group that she apparently uh, nurtured. And you know other names in the past. We read about many Chilton who served faithfully on the piano. Those people gave time, effort, hours, energy to nurture some of you to nurture others in our community. And that is part of the reason we're still here today. Because of their work. And all of us know enough to know they got tired. They got discouraged. They got frustrated. They probably wanted to quit sometimes. I'm sure they asked themselves, is it worth it? Is it making a difference? Those are the things we ask ourselves. But there are lives changed because of their efforts. And that's what I'm calling you to now. That we invest ourselves in others because hopefully, and I trust, that in your life, you can say, the Lord's been good to me. The Lord has helped me and to want to share that to others. And so we are trying to get in sync with God. Henry Blackaby wrote a study, wrote a book, and then it turned into a study called Experiencing God. And one of his key points is, too often when we're seeking to serve God, we come up with what we think is a great idea. And we say, Lord, bless me. Bless what I'm doing. Bless my efforts. We don't pause to say, is this what you want? Is this how you want it? And what he encourages all of us to do in that workbook is to look and see where God is working and then get involved with God. Join Him. Not us come up with what we think is a brilliant idea, and it may be a good one but it's not his idea. So getting in sync with what he is doing. And, there, and he is stirring in the hearts of many of our people. I'm not going to call them out. But they're desiring ministry. The archery is one fruit of that. And I will say, Susan Mullins has really been driving that. Last spring, she said, Wes, I wondered if we could involve the archery with our student ministry, at least give them something to do. And I liked the idea, but I, I said, well, Susan, what about if we did that in the summer? And she liked that idea. And so she started talking to people to help us to do that. And I think we've had a very successful two sessions so far. I've even got uh, a person in our community who contacted me, nothing to do with the church, hadn't had anything to be here before, say, I'd like more information. People are seeing it. And it's a way for ministry. And like I said, we're doing the devotion. I had somebody else come to me that has a burden for the young women, younger than us, women in our community, that there be a time, a place where they could come away and have a support group, a group that is centered on Jesus Christ. And we're working on that. We're moving in that direction. Some of you will be hearing about that more in the days to come. God is stirring in the hearts of people with a desire, with our people, with a desire to minister, to find how to minister to them. And so we're seeking to get in sync with God. We're starting that with prayer. My prayer has intensified and increased 
as I spend my time before God trying to make sure his mind, because honestly, humanly, it's creating more work. One of the things we plan to do that we voted on in a business meeting last week was to restart Wednesday night Bible study, Wednesday night church, midweek prayer meeting, we've often called it. And we're going to study the minor prophets. So guess who gets to study and prepare lessons in the minor prophets? But I get to share that with you. And so that's one thing we're in September, we're going to have, uh, we're going to start that and we're going to hopefully draw you in to worshiping on Wednesday night. We're, we're hitting Sunday school because these things touch at the heart of God drawing families together, and it's not an easy path. It's an uphill path, but nothing good comes easy. Weightlifters talk about no pain, no gain. Athletes say that. It's going to require effort, and you know what, folks? We'll have greater results when we have greater participation. So we're called reaching out to some of you. Some of you were going to ask to become prayer warriors. I'm working on list of names, list of topics, at going to ask you to make them a matter of fervent prayer each day of your week. Nothing is going to succeed without prayer. We need that prayer foundation. And some of you who think, I'm, I'm too old, I'm, I'm not able to do, and I know you're not, but I also know you've done it before, that you've done the work, that you've knocked on the doors, but you can pray for us. And so I'm going to be asking you to become a prayer warrior. Others were asking to teach and be a, a, an assistant in a classroom. It's catching the vision, God's vision, that he's commanded through the years. He started with the Israelites. The Israelites were supposed to proclaim Jehovah God to their world. They didn't do it very well. They made him a nationalistic God. They kept him to himself. They didn't think other people were worthy of knowing God. Jesus Christ came and he tore the veil down and he opened the kingdom of God which was really open to everybody all the time. But he opened it up, showing the Jews, showing the people of the day that Christ is for everybody, that everybody can go into the Holy of Holies, that it's open to the barbarian, to the Greek, to the slaves, to us, because that is us. So that's been God's heart from the time he created man is for people to know Him, for people to figuratively walk in the garden with Him, for people to be able to find that peace and tragedy as Ed shared with us about the song. And God has called us to do that. And so, we want to get in sync with God. To do that, we've got to look in His Word. He's told us in here how to live, how to honor Him, how to talk to people about Him. And we go to Him in prayer, asking Him to cleanse us for ministry so that His Holy Spirit can work freely. You see, we can quench the Spirit. We can grieve the Spirit by our selfish ways, by our pride, by our stubbornness, by our refusal to submit and yield to His leadership. We can quench it. All-powerful God that created the universe can be stifled by our hardness of heart. And so we come to Him saying, Lord, cleanse me. Make me whiter than snow. Release your Holy Spirit in me. Forgive me for quenching the Spirit, for grieving the Spirit. 
Use me, Lord. I'm scared to death. I don't know what you're going to call me to. But I want to serve you, Lord. That's what it takes to get in sync with Him. And then one of the things, and I'll, I'll, I'll draw this to a close. I, I could go on, but I won't. In the conference we had yesterday where he was sharing, it was caring, caring for members and friends through Sunday school and small study groups, Bible study. And he brought out the point, Darrell did, that Jesus said, as I have loved you, love one another. He, he cared about us. He cared about us to come and die on the cross. He cared about us enough to send the Holy Spirit to help us through the day. He cared enough about the people of His day to heal them. He could do that. But to pray for them, to provide food for them, to minister to them, to put them first. Jesus put in long days serving people. And so we show the care of Jesus Christ by caring for each other, by caring for each other. And that's what Darrell was sharing with us, very specific steps to do that. As I listened, and I shared this with the group at the end of the day, the one word that came through me to me through that whole conference was intentional. You see, we care for each other. When we hear about someone having surgery, someone losing a family member, we pray for them. We take them food if that's appropriate. We, we care. But we're not very intentional about the people we don't know. And we're not intentional enough about saying, I care for you because of the love of Jesus Christ. And I want you to know that hope. So intention and being intentional in ministry was the word that really came to me yesterday. And that's what I pray we will be. Intentional not to find my comfort, not to find my pleasure, not to stroke my pride, but intentional in telling and showing the love of Jesus Christ to others. That's being in sync with God. So we bathe this in prayer. And then as you go about your day and God speaks to you or God brings somebody in your path, then do like Nehemiah did here. I prayed to the God of heaven to get that extra juice of His Spirit, that extra juice of His wisdom, that those words that you need to say that you don't know how to say or what to say. That's what God's waiting for. And He's promised that as we yield to Him, as we lay all on the altar, that He will pour open the storehouses of heaven and that we will bear fruit that will last. All of us know fruit doesn't last. Bananas turn brown and go bad. Apples get a soft spot. And go. That's not what God's talking about. He's talking about souls that accept Jesus Christ as their Savior that then go on to eternal life when that breath is gone. That's being in sync with God. And that's where we are. And that's where we are before God. Will we get in sync with Him? Or will we continue to say, get in sync with me, God? Which means I'm saying I'm more important. What I want is more important than what you want. We would never verbalize that. But when we insist on our direction, on our way, on our comfort, on our pleasure, that's what we're doing. Instead of, like Paul said, I will be all things to all people. It's been a great service today. Great reminder, be thou my vision. That's what I'm talking about. 
a great reminder that in the troubles we have, we have strength because we can say, it is well with my soul. We have that power and strength. And the reason God does that is so we can trust Him with our cares and concerns and turn our energies to telling others about Jesus Christ. Pray with me as we go into our closing song. Dear precious Father, Your Word tells us You are not a God of confusion. You have a purpose. You have a plan. It has not deviated over the years. It has not changed. Lord, as You move, it can seem chaotic to us because things we're expecting to happen don't happen. Ways that we're thinking they're going to go, they don't go that way. Father, we can kick against the pricks. We can have turmoil, frustration. Or we can say, okay, Lord, what are you saying? Which way do you want me to go? Trusting that you are leading in our life even when it doesn't make sense to us and saying, I surrender all. Father, it is my prayer that each and every heart here receives this word today. That you made them fearfully and wonderfully. They're who you want them to be. They have the attributes and talents that you want them to have. They have the temperament. We need all, Lord, to do your work. That they would realize that they are the creation of an almighty God and they're special. And that you are the potter, we are the clay, and we sing, mold me and make me. Lord, may we all yield our will, our spirit, our pride, our wants, our desires to the Most High God, El Shaddai. Saying, Lord, here am I. Send me. Father, I thank you for these folks. They are faithful to you. They have been here. They, they have worked. Lord, I ask that you would remember them. Remember their sacrifices. Remember their offerings. Remember their efforts on your behalf. And bless them and their continuing efforts. You know the cares of each heart, Lord. You know what's troubling them. You know where they're hurting. You know where they're angry. You know what's going inside when we wear a smile on our face. Heal, Lord. Heal the emotions. Heal the hurts. Resolve the anger. Touch us, Lord. Draw us close to you. Lord, help us to stop quenching the Spirit and respond as you lead. It's because of Jesus Christ that we have this assurance and this ability that we have the Holy Spirit indwelling within us to make that possible. Father, release the Holy Spirit in each life in here today. It is in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Mm -hmm.